Hello, Mark here. Welcome to RC Hacker. Now today I've got an old Futaba, Futaba. I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, let me know in the comments below if you've got an opinion on it. But it's an old four channel AM 72 megahertz radio. It's got this enormous old antenna, really long ones. No, some people may not be familiar with these and it is it's uh, the model number is T4NL I'll put a link below to the uh, manual I managed to find the manual on the internet so uh, you can have a look at that if you like and let's um, take it apart and take a closer look let's go all right before we take it apart I'm just gonna we'll just have a closer look at the exterior um, this is, is it mode one, well throttle on the right, which is not the way I like to fly, so I might swap this over. Um, it's got a little power output gauge on there, big switch on the front. I don't have batteries for this. What else can we see? It says here, digital proportional radio control system. Well, I thought these were all analog, but we'll have a look inside. Um, amplitude mod modulation, AM. Heart of a nice flight, says there. That's a nice little little slogan there. And internal radio frequency module system. So, and on the back, um, I don't know what that sticker was. It's all faded out. And it says here, model aircraft use only. Surface use prohibited by FCC regulation. So, FCC is that from the States, I think. You know, you could use 72 megahertz for model aircraft only and not for model boats and cars, which now it's sort of all the same thing. Now, the controls, you know, they've got adjustable sticks, nice and clicky there, and, and these are our trim adjustments. Trim adjustments are really nice, they've got definite clicks in there. And they kind of feel really good, but that's it, there's no screen. Um, no digital mixing or anything like that, or model memory or anything like that. This is as simple as it gets. Now, this is the receiver. She's um, pretty heavy for its size. Now, and these are two of the servos as well that come with it. The servos have this weird plug. I don't know what you call that. I think it might be called a J-type plug with pins sticking out instead and they just they plug in like that. Um, I've only got two servos so if I want to make use of this I probably have to jury rig some sort of other servo connections. It also came with this on off switch. Um, I've cut these off here now like this plug was here. This goes onto the battery section of the receiver here and this one is a charge plug. Um, sorry, this this end plugs into the receiver, and this one would plug into the battery. I'm not sure on the purpose of the fourth wire why they'd even need that on the battery. And when it's turned off, it connects this one, so it can go to a charging circuit. And when it turns on, it connects this one through to here. I'm assuming that's what it does. I, I did have a little play around with it earlier. And I think that's what it does. Anyway, let's quickly power it up, make sure it all works. Okay, so I've hooked it up on the power supply here and you can see that on the right here, we have, I'm running it at 10 volts because this used to use an eight cell uh, NICAD battery pack. And on the right, I'm running this one at five volts because that would use a, the receiver and the servos would be powered by a four cell uh, NICAD pack as well. And um, it works fine, no problems at all. When it's idle, the transmitter, it's using about 150 milliamps and the receiver, about 30 milliamps there. And you can see as we move the servos, starting to draw a little bit more. Now, I've, I was wondering about this power indicator. I'm pretty sure it's just hooked up to the actual uh, battery. It's just a battery voltage indicator because if I change, change the voltage here, you can see that 
hopefully you can see that you can see that um, power indicator going down so as you get close to your 1.1 cells it's almost 1.1 volt per cell it's almost flat so put it up back up to 10 which is about normal I think when they're fully charged you know you might be 1.3 1.4 volts per cell so uh, it looks about right let's just leave it at 10 volts now right now it's drawing about 1400 milliamps if I extend the antenna see if that makes a difference it's gone up a bit to 150 milliamps maybe that indicates you know the power's getting out through the antenna a bit better um, let's disconnect the antenna entirely see what happens there you go it goes down even further so and also that power indicator that power indicator doesn't change as I disconnect and reconnect the antenna so it's got nothing to do with the um, with the energy output with the RF energy output at all it's just a battery voltage thing all right let's um let's take it apart and have a look inside okay so I've already pulled the screws out the back um, it's got rather a big um, battery cover on the back and it's actually got switches to reverse your servos here so if you you know that's the only way they could reverse the servos and it's actually quite a handy feature on radios like this if you didn't if you had a radio without that feature you had to get the design right in the model first and it was really a pain and there we go look at this this is like old school electronics single board single sided board I should say lots of resistors and capacitors I'd say this bit on the side is the AM the radio module like I said on the front I think it comes off there we go so that's our radio module and look on the, on the back of that um, you probably it's probably all been hand soldered and stuff so these 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 radios were quite expensive in their day like I don't know the exact price if anyone knows let me know you guys might have owned one now this board has only got one I guess you could call this a digital component um, it's an L9362 and I did a bit of a Google and that chip is the one that takes your four analog inputs and spits out a um, PPM signal I've got a I've got a sheet of that I'll put that up on screen so you can have a look at that now apparently if you want to hack this and put a new uh, some sort of other transmitter module in it say 2.4 gigahertz or something like that you need to solder to this pin up here which is pin 9 and that's your PPM signal so you could take a wire from that and take your ground and then you could pop that into your open LRS NG or, or whatever and you can make this old radio into to use a, um, modern receivers instead now let's go a little bit deeper so I'll pull this board off and look on the other side um, the, the, the tracks on this one look like they've been designed by a different engineer um, but there's a bit of a copper shielding here that goes on the other side of that little IC that we saw. Oh, on the IC there's a few bodge capacitors too. I did, you know, they obviously stuffed up somewhere with the original design. And the antenna wire comes back to this board, so obviously the, the antenna signal is coming out of one of these pins and then back out. I don't know if I can see that. Uh, 30 great long antenna which has got to be really long because 72 megahertz is a very long wavelength now one thing I did want to do was I wanted to swap this over so the throttle was on the other side and it looks like all I need to do is 
take this part here, this screw and this spring, and pop that over onto the other side, and then take this, this, this little bit of metal here, unscrew that, and pop that onto there. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to swap this over so I can use it for other small projects. I'm not going to convert it to 2.4 or open LRS at the moment. I've got another radio for that for now. But if you wanted to do that yourself, um, just remember that pin 9 is the one you need, need to worry about. And of course, you've got to do something about the batteries you need between you know, about 10 volts in there to make this work. Now, what else I found as I was swapping these over is that each of these uh, is the, the springiness, like the force that the stick provides back to, you know, the amount of force that's, that it provides to return it to the center. You can actually adjust it for each of the axes really, really easily. And, you know, you just adjust this screw and it increases the uh, tension on on um, the relevant spring to adjust how much springing it, how much effort you have to put into actually pushing these controls. And actually, I might I might reduce it a little bit because they're they're really nice. They've got ball bearings in there. I think so. Do they have ball bearings in there? No, they don't. Now there are no ball bearings in here, but it is very very well made. And you can see this this wire that. The, there's only two of these wires that have to move and you know they've protected it here with this big long rubber piece and they've wrapped them around here and glued them to protect them so all the flexing is spread out along this you know quite a long section there. I have had to already replace um, some of the joins on my on my 9x that just it just wore out, but more more so because I was taking the radio apart and putting it back together lots and lots of times. But still, you know, this sort of thing, it's well designed. You know, the antenna wire here, uh, that's a bit dodgy. The actual screws come loose at the bottom there. But other than that, it's very, very well designed. Okay, and on, the, uh, on our little AM module here, it's worth also noting that th th these have a crystal right now this crystal is what defines you know what frequency it's going to transmit on in this case it's 72.39 megahertz and these crystals uh, these crystals crystal these crystals you can swap them so if you wanted to fly with someone else at the same time you would both have to make sure that you had different value crystals in here otherwise you know, you'd be trying to control the other person's plane and it wouldn't work very well. Modern systems now, they um, digitally time slice the actual 2.4 gigahertz uh, spectrum and they time slice it and they frequency hop so you can have many, many different um, radios and models flying at the same time. But these ones, you they only transmitted on one frequency at one time. Um, and in this case, AM and if you wanted to change the frequency that your radio was operating you would have to swap this crystal out with another one and likewise you would have to match that with the crystal that is on the receiver and uh, that's just in here so and if we pull that one out pull that one out um, this one says 72.5 on one I guess that refers to the the type but again it's 72.39 so it's it's the exact frequency there while we're at it let's pull this baby apart and have a look inside so this just has two screws and take that back off oh wow look at that that is packed that is absolutely chock-a-block. I'm guessing this again is a single-sided board. Look at the detail on that board. Isn't that amazing? Like it's really, really packed in there. And let's try and pry it open here. That 
that is really, really uh, compact in there. Like for comparison, th this is doing more than just this board because it's got to well receive the signal and then decode it and then output it into each of the um, servos as well. So there's a lot going on in this and it doesn't look like there may be one IC in here I think um, one integrated circuit there which might be responsible for splitting up that uh, that combined PPM signal into the separate channels here I, that's just a guess as to what that module is you can't actually get in there and see what the um, what's written on that component but it's interesting that it, instead of like a flat component like the other one it's actually up on its end anyway so i hope you've enjoyed that teardown right so there you go an old vintage radio cheers thanks for watching uh please subscribe and um see you next episode wow <laughs> i hear it Oh, I built flaps into it. Crow brakes.